people are so excited for this game. I mean, this is really bloody and really awesome and innovative, and there's crazy enemies, and it just looks fantastic. It's very realistic when it comes to the weapons and the costumes. It's very fantastic when it comes to the sort of superhuman athletics and the magical powers. It's exploring new worlds, seeing um, new places and new creations. Fantastic, beautiful historical vistas and crazy neon-filled New York skylines. You might think, well, oh, this is a game that's just going to look good and gameplay is secondary, but fans of the series know the gameplay is not going to be secondary. I've never seen violence that was that crazy, just so over the top that it's like the best of the slasher movies out there. The dismemberment uh, is, that's, that's amazing. This, this game is non-stop action. I mean, one after another, boom, 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 boom. It's to the point where it's, it's like so over the top, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. You know, it's like you do it again. Oh, can I do it again? And you just want to keep doing it. There's just body parts all over, and it's awesome. <laughs> The thing about Team Ninja is they're very, very specialized, very, very skillful. They have this amazing reputation that's kind of a little intimidating, but you know if you send them in, the job's going to get done. Team Ninja, to simply call them game developers, is to not understand who they are. They give games a soul, a tight-knit clan. Their vision, their passion, and their drive begins with their leader. Tomonabu Itagaki, a free spirit who demands perfection. Itagaki definitely stands apart from his games. He really walks into a room as if he was Mick Jagger circa 1973. There's just something so kind of raw and exciting about him that you can feel that who he is is so consistent with the games that he makes. Nidagaksan is the driving force, he is the inspiration, he is the one who, you know, really kind of lays down everything, not only in terms of what he wants to see in his game, but also the philosophy, how we act, how, you know, everybody treats each other. If I met a hundred people, probably only three would be people that I would actually be able to relate to. It's very important to have those people with you and nearby. And when it comes time to fight, those are the kind of people you need by your side, and those are the kind of people you have to have in order to accomplish something. Itagaki-san is the headmaster, and I think he looks at Team Ninja as his family. The true ninja were not lone warriors of stealth. They were part of a clan, and that clan was everything to them, providing moral and spiritual guidance. The commanders of the ninja families knew what was in the best interest for the family. Decisions in terms of tactics, how things would be done, which battles to engage in, which battles to withdraw from, were all made from that bigger vision. The clan was very, very important. They wanted to keep their village peaceful, and that, that was all what they wanted. We do have Itagaki-san, who is kind of our clan leader, so to speak. He's the closest thing we have to being a super ninja, so we have that trust and that respect there. He's always right out there, at the forefront, leading his troops and fighting his battles. I really feel like I can rely on him, and I can be one of the troops that's following him as he's blazing the trail. Every single person on the team, from you know the highest Itagaki-san to the lowest, you know, guy working in the trenches, they all are like 
I'm going to do my best job on this particular element. When you have 80, 90 people with that same goal, it's just, it's just amazing. A rule is a symbol. Do your best and never lie. Itagaki is faced with issues big and small every day. Because his vision comes from within, his decisions are swift and true. I think it's amazing how he's able to come in and make decisions swiftly and decisively. He's just saying, look, you know, if a decision needs to be made, I'll just make it and then let's move on to the next thing. He will, literally, not joking. He'll make an instant decision and he'll make the best decision right then and there, and I think that's a gift that he has and I trust them implicitly when it comes to making those kinds of decisions. I tend to look for people that have things that I don't have, that can bring something that I don't possess to the team, and a good example of that is Matsui. In Ninja Gaiden 2, the main character, Ryu Hayabusa, is a character that was designed by Matsui. The character of Ryu Hayabusa had existed before I even started working at Tecmo. It was in the old Ninja Gaiden games for Nintendo Entertainment System back in the 80s. The first Ninja Gaiden was the story of him kind of realizing his potential as the Super Ninja. As we see him throughout his journey in Ninja Gaiden 2, he is um, kind of using that knowledge and applying that to every situation that he's, he's running into. You can kind of see that progression as he grows up. I have a big crush on Ryu. He is um, a super stud as well as a super ninja. He's powerful, he's strong and silent. He's got, you know, those massive biceps and he can, you know, kill anything in his path. He is somewhat of iconic character, this mysterious, very charismatic character in many ways. We wanted to portray Ryo Hayabusa as being the kind of ninja that comes along once in many generations. I realized back when making Ninja Gaiden 1 that we had to go all the way back and think about what are ninjas themselves. What makes a ninja who he is? The ninja of Japan uh, had several famous qualities. One was enduring patience. In fact, the nin of ninja, when you write it, that's what it translates as, enduring patience. It means I've got my eye on the big goal, the big battle, and I'm not tempted to get involved in little small battles along the way. Skills like moving across water, uh, up a castle wall in a shadow, this was of great necessity to the ninja because the ninja was an intelligence gatherer. They needed to go secretly into areas where they could find out what was going on. Their entire existence depended on every individual member, willing to sacrifice their lives for the sake of the greater good. That was a core concept that I knew we needed to express first before we could delve into his character even deeper. Every day was the potential for extreme violence. And so to live with that uh, every day, knowing this may be my last day, this may be the last day my family lives, uh, took an enormous amount of strength. To be balanced physically and mentally, uh, it's a very important. Otherwise, you're going to be like one-sided kind of person. So to find a balance in between becomes very important. The way of the ninja required one to balance mind and body, 
break down the Japanese ideogram for Nin, you'll find heart and blade. You can inspire the heart, but also require a blade. It's okay for a game to be slightly unbalanced, but it has to have an overall sense of beauty to it. It's obvious when you look at itagaki sans games that he wants them to look good in service to the gameplay, to show the intensity of the violence. Um, the beauty is definitely important because we need that to contrast with the violence because we're trying to create an overall image. There was a book many years back about Japanese philosophy called Chrysanthemum and the Sword. And Chrysanthemum is a symbol of beauty, and the sword is a symbol of fighting and winning. We really try to bring those elements together so that you have the beautiful backdrops, but then you have the violence and you have the fighting that's going on in front of it. I strive to include things that everybody can find beautiful. The flower, bird, the wind, the moon. These are the things that are universal, that everybody finds beautiful. Kacho Fugetsu. Ka is flower, Cho is bird, Hu is the wind, and Getsu is the moon. And those are the elements that are really used in Japanese uh, art. <laughs> There are a lot of beautiful types of flowers. I think that some of the ones we like are, of course, the cherry blossoms because of how beautiful they are, but also how fragile. I think if you go back and look at all of our games, you see that they all include cherry blossoms at one point or another. I'm from the countryside, mountains and rivers and things like that, so I really like the beauty of the landscapes. So I may go to a river, and I'll notice like a stand of reeds or some plants by the side of the river, and I'll get down with my camera and get down into a low pose and take a shot with the light coming from the other side. I'll go back and I'll look at how the light behaves and how it shines, and I'll say, is it possible to recreate that effect? I think it's important not only to try to mimic reality, but also try to understand what makes that environment beautiful. People who play a game developed by Itagaki-san, they're looking for a high difficulty level, but they're also looking for this almost irreverent cultural tone. You don't have too many games that are set in modern times with a kind of ancient hero. So it's kind of a different perspective because the settings are modern day, but his abilities are still rooted in, in the past, in the ninja tradition. I think every Japanese feels the respect towards that ninja culture, and that's something that is always present. The influence is huge. It's in my DNA. To go to the birthplace of the ninja, one must travel outside of Kyoto to the mountains of Iga. The mountains of Iga are not tall, high mountains. They're old mountains. There was a young warrior who came from the village of Togakure, and he ended up in Iga. He encountered these teachers in the mountains. There were lots of people living in that area. They came from China, really. They developed their uh, own fighting style. And this is how the Togakure lineage of uh, the ninja began. The samurai families were the noble aristocrats who ran the country. A ninja tried to gain political control that would allow them to be leaders of their own destiny. 
The definition of winning was different for a warlord or a samurai than it was for a ninja. And I think examining how the ninja lived and how they prepare for that fate is what kind of interests me. Their approach to war was very different because the ninja didn't have the uh, money, they didn't have the people to mount a similar army, so they needed a different way of winning. And that created what we know of uh, as the art of the ninja. The ninja of feudal Japan have faded into history, but the teachings of ninjutsu live on, passed down through generations. We're in the Hombu Dojo. This is where it originates from uh, in the, the ninjutsu world. This is Hatsumi Sensei's dojo. Masaaki Hatsumi was my ninja teacher. I moved to Japan in the 1970s to study with him. In, in one fashion. And he's the 34th head of this Togakure lineage. His teacher was Toshitsugu Takamatsu, uh, the 33rd headmaster. He was born in the 1800s. Takamatsu Sensei chose Hatsumi Sensei as his heir, as the one to take it on into the uh, 20th century. There are five important teachings in ninjutsu, undying devotion. You must always follow the precepts of a true path, natural endurance, natural transcendence. And the last is enlightenment. This essence of light is the same way the sun gives off radiance to the earth. The tradition that he has is uh, around 900 years old. So our lineage, we refer to it as 34 generations old. In this particular type of a clan, it's not bloodline, but this is a clan. The whole ninja culture was based on preserving the clan because in ancient Japan, there was a feudal system. Everyone was a member of a caste, but the ninjas were outcasts. They weren't part of the system, so their entire existence depended on every individual member, willing to sacrifice their lives for the sake of the greater good. The dragon sword is gripped firmly in the hands of young ninja Ryu Hayabusa. In Ninja Gaiden, the Hayabusa clan is Ryu's family. It was their fate that sent Ryu on this path. In the story of the first game, the Lord of the Greater Fiends Doku is sent to the Hayabusa village to retrieve the Dark Dragon Blade, and in the process, he slays all of Ryu's clan members. He basically decides to set off on revenge. So the story of Ninja Gaiden 1 is Ryo Hayabusa's journey to the Vigor Empire to wipe it out, and he is ultimately successful. In ancient days, if someone lost their family, a ninja's clan was wiped out. Their view was that the spirits of that clan, they, they still exist. They still have an investment in what happens on the earthly plane. It would be that one last ninja's moral imperative to go out and right the wrongs that created uh, the ability for these murders to happen. That becomes his whole mission in life. Ryu, they're heading for the Hayabusa village. Your clan is in danger. The story of Ninja Gaiden 2 is not directly related to the first game. Ryo, of course, defeated all of the fiends of the Vigo Empire in the first game, but there is actually another group of fiends that exists. Dagra Dai resurrects and restores the Archfiend to power. They are planning to resurrect this deity, this god of theirs called the Archfiend. Once again, the Hayabusa village ha is attacked um, because it holds a sacred artifact that these fiends need to attempt this resurrection. Hayabusa basically has to once again uh, avenge the deaths uh, of his fellow clan members. 
there is another uh, side element that's very important, which is the struggle between the Black Spider Ninja Clan. Their leader, uh, whose name is Genshin, provides a foil for Hayabusa. How the vaunted Dragon Ninja bloodline has withered. The uh, Black Spider Ninja Clan, under the leadership of Genshin, has kind of teamed up with the Fiends. Ryuhayabusa is the quintessential male hero. He reflects all of the ideals that we have, you know, about fighting for something that you believe in, about, you know, wanting to protect your loved ones, about, you know, wanting a justice against evil. Even though you, you have that ruthlessness part of him, you know the things that, why he's doing things, and as you're controlling him, it's for a good cause, or there's some justice in it, and the, the storyline behind the game is towards that justice, and I think that warrior code does come out. We wanted to portray in his character the feeling that not only is he incredibly powerful, but he has responsibilities. He isn't a lone wolf. He is part of a clan. A lot of times you have to story first, and then you come up with the enemies. But this time around, our artists came up with a group of amazing, high-quality enemies, but we couldn't put them all in. So we had to figure out how we were going to organize them. So we started out with getting four greater fiends, who are kind of the big bosses of the game. You may call me Alexei. Wolf, greater fiend and ruler of storms. I am Sidonius, ruler of flame. I am Elizabeth. So that's how things started. Now we know who our main bosses are going to be but we have a huge amount of high-quality enemies that have already been modeled and are ready to be put in. Now, for various reasons, we can't put every single one of those enemies in. We went in and decided what enemy was going to be in the game and which were not. Every guy on a team has enemies that he likes, that he's worked on, he doesn't want to see go. We might be out drinking one night and one of the team members would saddle up to me with a drink and he'd be acting like a door-to-door -door salesman. He'd be like, well, you know, that this enemy has a really cool tail attack and I just want you to know that he could be really fun in certain situations. So some enemies actually got put back in because some of the team members were so attached. The enemies in the game, they really come at you with everything they've got. They're just filled with a desire to finish you off. That increases the pleasure that you get when you finally defeat those enemies. The enemy AI is responding intelligently to the battle that's going on. So the way you injure the enemy AI is going to actually influence the way they fight you. The intensity of the fighting is going to be ratcheted up because this enemy is going to feel more threatened. They're going to be desperate. You almost feel like you're playing against a human player. The first game was basically, you got an enemy's life down to zero, now he's dead. But in this game, you can lop off limbs and then do an obliteration technique, which will finish an enemy off quicker. And one of the coolest things about the obliteration technique system is, is that it'll actually change up the move depending on the situation. So you might get one move for you know a left arm, and you might get another move for a right arm, and then a different move for for you know a decapitation or for a leg missing. So even on the same weapon and even on the same enemy, you're going to see different animations depending on what happens. So if an enemy loses an arm or loses a leg, their AI will change accordingly and the attacks that they do will change accordingly. If an enemy has lost an arm or a leg, you can finish them off quicker. So you have the incentive to finish the battles faster. Very important to be able to win a fight as quickly as possible. That's what the ninja wanted to do. 
get it over with very quickly so that somebody else wouldn't sneak a lucky move in or uh, wear down the ninja or give them time for their allies to show up and assist them. So it became very, very important. One move, fight's over. Hidegaku-san has talked about a lot in interviews. There's definitely a uh, idea in the Japanese warrior code that um, you know if you're fighting a guy uh, uh, who's you know reasonably skilled, that there should be a certain amount of respect. Hayabusa, you know, respects this, and rather than letting an enemy, you know, suffer, putting them out of their misery is one way of saying, "Hey, I respect you. You fought well. Now it's time for your soul to go on to the next plane."